Um, welcome everyone to the um, the second speaker series video I've done this year with Data Sock. And um, today we have Sachin from um, Helix Works Technologies, and he's going to talk to us a bit about the company and his work, his background. And um, so, do you want to maybe just give us a bio about yourself there for Sachin? Yeah. So, hi everyone, and uh, my name is Sachin Chalapati. I'm the CTO at Helix Works. Helix Works is a biotech technology uh, company, but we also focus primarily on information sciences. And our primary focus is uh, the next generation of data storage systems. We uh, started Helix Works in 2016, and it's been uh, raised more than a million euro over the time. And uh, we've been in the field of biotech and bioinformatics for a while. So yeah, I'll give you a quick introduction, even my presentation for everybody who wants to just go through and yeah, you know, get in touch. Yeah. So if I can uh, share my screen. Yep, yeah. should be able to there. Uh, I think so. Yeah, brilliant. I've got it there. So, yeah, my name is Sachin, and uh, let's get started. So we all know that we consume a lot of data. We also create a lot of data. We being the like you know the biggest rate in data consumption apparently happened during COVID because everybody is at home. They are creating new content and they are consuming new content. And we all knew that we have a semiconductor crisis on our hands. There isn't enough semiconductors that can be produced, that can be produced, or that can be actually reused. So. The crunch is not just because people are using more content or creating more content, but we also have a lot of legacy content that we don't know where to leave them. The legacy content is, is the content that we actually recover from already existing data servers, or you know you have some data coming from the museums, you have data that is uh, so legacy that it is being carried out from the 18th century. So what do we do with all the old data and we don't even have the semiconductors for storing the data that we are generating today. So an estimate says that we're going to go over uh, like, uh, you know, 1000 zettabytes in the coming future, which is a large amount of data from where we are at now. We are at around like 50 zettabyte at the point, but we don't have enough capacity to even store the 50 zettabytes that we are generating now. There is no system or there is no hardware or a platform that people can use or apply for the data that we are going to generate. As we are seeing that, uh, you know, semiconductors can only go to a point and we are already at that limit at this point. So we, we, the biggest issue right now is, should we actually store the data? Should we actually keep the archival data? Or should we just dump the data and forget and move on? You know what is the best way that we can go forward because there is no way uh, like the, the current estimate that we can actually keep all this data that we are generating. So let's go back to what you know what are the primary devices or the platforms that store data at this point of time. We have hard disk which is based on magnetic tape and we have flash devices which is based on semiconductors and silicon. So right now we, we can see that, you know, it's been a marvelous year going with the move store. We've been, you know, churning more semiconductors, decreasing the, you know, the size, increasing the capacity, having the 3D NAND type of storage where we are not just increasing the planar surface, but also in the 3D level. So it's been, we've been, uh, you know, improving over the decades, but we can see since 2010, 2015, the big iPhone, the big Mac, the big consumption revolution, we've been actually plateauing. So we've been crunching every bit and piece of the semiconductors that we can produce, every bit and piece of the uh, you know tape media or hard disk devices that we can actually produce. So every device that can be produced is actually being manufactured. We don't have a large demand and there isn't a, a platform that can actually come and meet that demand or there isn't a platform that can actually uh, resolve this demand in the near future. So we have, uh, you know, a biggest, uh, you know, thing in business is when you have a huge demand and there isn't enough production, there is some innovation that is needed. There is some platform that needs to be invested in. 
and investigate it so that we, there is a way for us to look into the future and say that maybe this is a way that we can actually catch up with the system, we catch up with the need that we are having. So the need, again, uh, to simplify, we need a material that is compared to silicon, that is comparable with uh, uh, tape devices, that is ready to use, that we can actually access this material, actually is able to refine this material in a way that we can use it. And it also needs to be cutting edge. It needs to be having properties that can be worked upon, that can also be improved on where we are at, because silicon uh, and transistors, the, the semiconductor industry gave a lot of cutting edge compared to older devices like tape or magnetic devices or even uh, punch cards. So there is a big revolution in transistors. So that gave us a big edge and that made us uh, make devices for four decades. So you also need a material that has this edge that can actually uh, make things better, not for today, but also for the time uh, to come on. And it also needs to be compliant with the industry standards. So there, like uh, since the 60s, there isn't much that has been changed in how we work with data. We need to write it, we need to cut, copy, paste, we need to work it, we can delete it, and we can, might, you know, we might be able to recover it. So the platforms are, you know, the systems are the same since the 60s, but we have changed how we work with it how fast we can work with it and how we can improve upon uh, you know, the, the industry standards. And it also needs to be reliable and robust. So it, it, the platform or the material that we are using to replace or to compete with the existing systems needs to be reliable. So it cannot be a 50% chance. It cannot be uh, a 30% chance that you might or might not have the data or you know, we cannot have that uh, edge cases where the platform might not be able to replicate, replicate uh, what we are trying to do. So the platform needs to be very reliable and the system needs to be very robust in what we are trying to do. So we took this challenge, we at Helixworks saw this challenge and felt that there is an opportunity because we come from a biotechnology perspective and we studied DNA and all its miracles because this is a system that life has used and it's a four billion year system where every cell since then has cut, copy, pasted, and you know, recover the data and use this data. It is a codex of life. It is actually the original data storage system that the planet ever made. So the, we felt that you know, it, it, it should be like, you know, there should be a way to take advantage of these protocols, to take you know, the whole system of a cell bit by bit and try to replicate it in, a, in, an, in an environment that is outside the cell. Can we use the system? Because uh, honestly, the chemical, the whole platform uh, reliability is proven. It's proven beyond a doubt. So we need to think about the system. And this is a system that will never go out of fashion. Since humans will be there for the millennia to come, the DNA will be coming along with them. So this is not a system that, you know, you can think about, oh, this is like an old punch card you need to replace with a new magnetic drive. This system, this platform never will go out of fashion. And the storage capacity is, is uh, exponentially greater than current semiconductor industry. It can store up to 215 petabytes for each gram of DNA. That's, that's really like, you know, amazing compared to a normal system that's uh, that's something that we actually need today, but unfortunately, we don't have all the things uh, to work with it at that scale. Yes, DNA has 215 petabytes per gram, but how are we going to make sure that you can actually operate at that scale of DNA? That is the biggest challenge. And uh, DNA is also very reliable and you know very robust. It has a self life of more than 100 years. Uh, just the naked DNA it can survive for a long time if stored properly. Uh, so. There is so many things that are going good with DNA, but uh, we have to think about the challenges on how to bring the system to market. The biggest challenge is, can we actually control DNA in vitro? In vitro means it's outside the cell. When you take the DNA outside the cell, when you remove every mechanism that it has evolved with, say the proteins, the enzymes, the whole system uh, of how a cell works, if you take everything outside, out, outside a cell and put it in a petri dish and say that, you know, 
This is the DNA that we want to work with. Can we operate it at that scale? That is the biggest challenge we have because normally in a cell, DNA functions like a labyrinth. So it's not a single unit operation that we imagine in a computer where it's a single operation with a bit, you write it, you read it, or you erase it. It's not gonna work the same way because DNA is like a labyrinth where it's more like a, like a car engine where different gears need to turn at the same time for one function to happen. This is a, this is a transistor 2.2. The, the complexity of DNA and how it works within a cell is very, very unique. And it's not easily replicable with, uh, you know, when we are working with it outside the cell. And because it's so complex, the generalization of parallelism where you, if you can work with one system, make a thousand systems of the same and it will work better. So it's, it's uh, the challenge of parallelism and making that same unit operation in a big scale is also challenging because DNA cannot usually operate like a unit operation that we see in a normal standard uh, data systems. So uh, coming to what we actually do at Helixworks, how do we tackle this challenge? Because we all know that DNA has the great properties of you know, how, we, how it can tackle the data storage problem, how we can hold so much capacity and hold so much promise. But when we see the challenges, we have to focus on the main parts on how do we take these unit operations outside the cell. We take this simple cut, copy, paste, and you know sequences that happen in a cell and bring it outside the cell. How do we do it in a normal platform, like a, say a silicon wafer? How we're doing, how can we replicate the same with DNA? And we take that challenge, we use enzymes. Uh, enzymes are the primary operators in data science that we can think of the same as a synonym for life. So in cells, the proteins, the enzymes work with the similar operations. So we take these enzymes, these proteins outside the cell and try to replicate the same operation that they might be doing in a cell. So that's our primary focus. That's our primary research where we try to innovate and you know, get new ideas and build new devices to work around that. So once we are able to replicate this, we need to automate the system. So on a layer uh, to the outsider, it should look like a normal hard disk. It should do the things that a normal hard disk can do. Maybe not the size of hard disk, maybe it is the size of a room, but it should also do the same uh, work or the, you know, the functions that a normal hard disk can, can do. So we try to automate the system so we can identify these pieces where we can attach and parallelize maybe uh, you know, all these systems and scale it. So this is what Helixworks does. As a, as a company and the areas that we work on, the primary uh, you know, tangent that we work with DNA. So the, our first uh, kind of uh, you know, product that we actually released is called DNA Drive, where people, users, end users can actually send us the data and we will try to store the data within DNA. That's our first take on how we want to go with about this. And uh, fortunately, we were able to collaborate with uh, Ubisoft and uh, Amber. So these two, Ubisoft is the gaming company and uh, Amber is a energy drink company from uh, Sao Paulo. So they asked us to store uh, the greatest gameplays and also some story about Rainbow Saints 6. And they asked us, you know, can you guys store this data in DNA and we'll add this DNA to energy drink. It is not a, a hard disk per se, you know, because energy drink you consume, you don't actually plug in a USB <laughs> drive to the uh, energy drink, but that's that's something uh, of a take that, yeah, as when we actually inquire, like, you know, why do you want uh, DNA in an energy drink? Is it, uh, could be just marketing? But uh, we've, they felt that, you know, it is, it is what we feel that you can actually a drinkable USB drive. We didn't really get the point, but, uh, but they, they felt that it's it's what you know every time uh, anybody sees that you know it's a link it's a tweet but why not a drink why not a drink can actually you know give you the data uh, but you know we felt it was an interesting collaboration so we took the data from them it was around uh, 3 kb which is not a huge amount of data because it is just hyperlinks and some story and we converted them into uh, dna 
code, ATGCs. And with our encoding schema, we again started to synthesize base by base and we were able to store all that data. And because it is DNA, you can replicate a small amount of DNA using a PCR. So even if you have a one microgram, you can make a gram of DNA of the same product. So we manufactured almost five milligrams for Ambev and we shipped them uh, the DNA. Then they took the DNA and made 250 cans of uh, fusion energy drink. They called it DNA Siege. So it, each can of the DNA, uh, you know, Siege has, you know, these highlight plays from the eSport uh, players and all the story about Rainbow Six. So this is a product this is an, uh, how we imagine, uh, you know, DNA drive to go forward. But this is an interesting take on how people think. Many people understood that DNA is not just, you know, uh, like you know, something that is very biological, something that is just in a cell. But people try to imagine, okay, DNA can be taken out of the cell, can be replicated, can be actually utilized just as a material, even outside the cell. So that's that's our. One of our uh, interesting ideas that we worked on. There were also some other areas that we worked with the same idea, but uh, this was one of the most interesting that I wanted to share. So, so what we actually uh, do in at Helix Works in a in a very specific scale is we only because DNA can be synthesized both chemically and biologically. Our take is more on the biological pathway where you know, we use enzymes and uh, products from the enzymes to manufacture the DNA because DNA is basically a chemical. You can take the same chemicals and use it as a chemical mode to synthesize DNA, but cells don't need it because they already have a DNA from their parent and parent generation or the previous generation. So they don't need to make their DNA, but they need to replicate. It is easy for the cells, but for us humans, we need to uh, make sure that we have a DNA that is made from scratch. So uh, for this, we use still like, you know, enzymatic sensors. Some parts are still, still chemical, even in our method, but we focus in completely changing the paradigm to only primarily enzymatic sensors as we go on. So we want to make all the DNA from scratch using the enzymes. And we work with polymerases and ligases. These are two different proteins, which polymerases make more DNA, ligases stitch DNA, if you want to, uh, minimize the, the functions. It's it's pretty simple. And we also use a, a repertoire of tools to sequence it because once you make the DNA, you are also you need to also able to read the DNA. Because the uh, big boom in the healthcare industry, now uh, people are getting their genome sequence, gene sequence, if they have some phenotype that they're showing, you know, if they have a condition, people are getting their uh, gene sequence at the hospital as well. So the tools how to read DNA are already well established and the science is almost three decades old, which is very convenient for us. So we are working to improve upon because the DNA for data is much, much huge than uh, say if you're sequencing a human genome, which is just 3 GB. So the data scales are huge. So we have our own uh, stream on uh, how to improve the sequencing platforms that are already established. So primary works on uh, say signal analysis and bioinformatics are also primary areas that we work at Helix Works. So uh, we work with how do we, you know, maintain the data that we are creating, uh, new encoding methods, new compression schemes for converting the binary data into DNA sequences. And uh, we also work uh, pretty much with every lab automation system. We want to make everything smaller and everything automated so that there will be minimal error and also minimal expense to make the reagents and the enzymes. So that's primarily what we do at Helixworks and what our focus right now at Helixworks is. So uh, this is a short presentation on what we do. Uh, and so we can, you guys can reach out to us at um, Twitter or through email or just visit our website and you know, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. So. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Brilliant. Yeah, that's great, Sachin. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> a few questions that even just popped into my head watching that. So obviously mm -hmm. you touched on kind of like silicon semiconductors is kind of the standard, I suppose, at the moment um, in that mm -hmm. field. And obviously everyone knows about the huge kind of struggles with supply of materials for that at the moment. Um, yeah. So I suppose if that's just a problem that you'll be kind of able to surpass with uh, this kind of alternative method of data storage. 
Yes, because uh, the primary, for, you know, the, the, the reason why the semiconductor industry is facing a challenge because nobody expected the boom to be so huge. Yeah. It's, it's very sudden and the supply chain cannot actually cope up with the demand. And people are looking not just us because uh, uh, there are companies in the US. Microsoft is also heavily invested in bringing out DNA data storage. So it's not just us that actually think that there is a possibility or an avenue that uh, people need to think about, but it's actually the industry is thinking, you know, is there a medium uh, to investigate upon? Just like how you think about quantum computers and, you know, is it another way to process data? Is DNA another way to store data? It's an investigative, but people are, uh, you know, they're believing more and more because the crunch is so tight and they don't have a, you know, not everybody is Apple, that, you know, that they can just throw money and get the chips made. So how do we scale? It's, it's a really big challenge. Yeah, and it's certainly like an urgent need because I think, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, that need for kind of data storage is just exponentially growing year on year. Um, so, yeah, so is aside from, I suppose, one of the main challenges then is just making a kind of user-friendly um, interface for consumers where it's it's not them having to look at what they'd see as kind of actual DNA and making it more familiar to them and yeah. um, to the similar hardware they have at the moment. Yeah, so uh, the interfacing is actually a pretty big challenge for us because none of the systems uh, have been built. All of the systems that you see in a USB or anything has been built from say, the 60s. But we have to find an interface that, okay, you still get an output just like a normal hard disk, but how do you make sure that all the internal parts or the robotics or all the unit operations can be operated with DNA uh, and DNA is usually operated in liquid medium. So it's something unlike what we use, but uh, I think it's, it's you know, uh, it's a challenge, you know, that we need to actually tackle, but it's an interesting challenge to work upon. Yeah, absolutely. I know for probably for a lot of consumers and even myself, who don't come from a kind of biotechnology background. It's yeah. it's quite quite a hard idea to grasp. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's um, it's actual DNA that would be storing the data. Um, so I think outside that, from a general view, um, I want to ask you a few questions on working in a startup um, mm -hmm. and how you find that on a kind of like day to day work. How would you describe it for yourself at the moment or? Uh, I think, you know, I would always, you know, even like, you know, going back, and back you know, 10 years back, I would always prefer, you know, being in a startup, even now I yeah. you know, always want to be in a startup because I think it's, uh, some days you, uh, you feel that, you know, okay, things are not going to go really good or, you know, there are challenges because you are trying to tackle something very interesting, very challenging, but also very rewarding when you're progressing. So it's, it's good, you know, yeah. and I feel that Ireland has, as a country, do have the startup structures and the foundations where people can come up with an idea and, you know, get supported for time being and also get accelerated if, they are, if the idea is good. So it is challenging for me as well, but I feel that, you know, it's a good idea to work upon and it is uh, gratifying, you know, when you get the rewards and people feel that, okay, this is actually having a potential, so... Uh, the the take is you know it, it is a rewarding uh, experience for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I'd say a lot of our members are probably in a similar mindset where they're weighing up, getting mm -hmm. into something that maybe they're passionate about, would like to develop an idea like that, yeah. rather than kind of just going into a already mm -hmm. established business and kind of just yeah. being a, I, a, I, I a cog because, in the machine. There, yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's so many ideas still to be discovered, so there is always room for new ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, is there any kind of maybe just general tips you'd have then for people kind of considering following a path similar to yourself? I would recommend always uh, team up because I wouldn't be able to uh, do this without my best friend, uh, Nimesh, who's the CEO of the company. And we've been friends for almost uh, more than a decade. Too. So we've been working uh, on, you know, we've been uh, uh, mates, you know, best friends since our bachelors. We went to uh, Sweden for our masters together. Then we were able to, you know, think about it, ideas and, you know, start up. So if you have company, you can always rely upon one on one another because it is very challenging environment. It always feels that you can, you know, why not do something else if you don't have somebody that actually can push you. Say that, okay, you know, sometimes he feels the same, sometimes I feel the same. It's always, you know, the team is the crucial part in the startup. If you build upon a good team, uh, it, it doesn't matter if your first idea fails. You can always, you know, team up to another, you know, great idea. So I always feel that, yeah, if you have a good team, always, yeah, 
build it yeah. uh, don't do it alone and you know try to do everything by yourself uh, team up you'll be good yeah certainly because it sounds like it, it helps you through the kind of challenges and difficult times which you're always going to have in that sort of um that sort of environment and um, pushing through challenges um what in particular attracted you to Ireland um for a start up uh i feel that ireland is uh, i mean maybe it is also uh, uh due to brexit the day uh, you know we arrived it's also like you know brexit might happen might not happen but yeah the uh, the interesting uh, space ireland is you know it is well connected to the west and the east and we coming from india we felt that you know because we were doing in uh, our masters in sweden we been uh, just visiting ireland and we felt that this is a very nice country to live in and we felt that uh, let's see an opportunity or investments you know that can come up so we uh, fortunately found sos ventures which is a venture capital in ireland based in ireland and they're also in us and they're now um, also in london so those guys saw the idea and as you know why don't you guys come up come here and then the irish government also has some grants for small, uh, small startup ideas to you know work upon even the eu government also helps us a lot we have grants from the eu uh, you know giving us money and also uh, it's also grant you know it's just a grant they don't take up your equity so you can have that equity with you and also still grow your ideas once the ideas are fruition you can always you know go to a bigger investor so the 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 environment for you know the basic level to you know a level where it is actually mvp where you have a minimal uh, viable product it's very good environment to be in ireland and it has that investment you know for it, most of the ideas that are coming up yeah yeah i understand what you mean and i suppose from a from a technology um perspective you're happy mm-hmm. that you have the kind of grants and the funding organized so you can kind yeah. of just focus on that rather than been worried about the liquidity yeah. and the mm-hmm. funding your research yeah. yeah um no so that's brilliant to hear um that's about all i have is there anything else you'd like to add before you go it was a brilliant presentation thanks for that thank you uh, uh i would ask like you know if anyone has any ideas or you know if they just want to touch base with me it's also fine so yeah, yeah. just visit our website and yeah if anyone got uh, anything to say yeah please let me know brilliant thanks emil um yeah. That's great. Um and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um we'll be back soon with another um another event for the speaker series. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for